It's a basic law. Okay, it's a spiritual truth. There's no law in the realm of the spirit. There's truth. There's when it comes to the dimension of the spirit, so to speak, when it comes to spiritual things, there's revelation. There's the revealing of things. There's not really like law or truth. It's revealing of things. It's the revelation of God. That's what really the spiritual man dimension is. It's God. That's where he exists. But in the revelation of God, in the a spiritual truth, so to speak, is that the less that you are, the greater he is. The more that you are, the less that he is. So you see, that's kind of why Jesus said to those that were following him that they had to take up their cross, deny themselves and follow him because for children it would have been easy. They were easily accepting anything he had to say. That whatever Jesus said or did, they were happy to do. He could tell them that there was a tooth fairy and they would believe him. He could tell them that there was a Santa Claus and they would believe him. He could tell them that there was a a leprechaun on St. Patty's Day and he would believe them. You see, because the children would follow Jesus because they would believe him, just like they follow you and they believe you until they find out you lied. But Jesus didn't lie. You see, Jesus always told the truth because he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So what we ought to do is follow his example. But because there's so much of us in what we do to our children, we actually make them into our image rather than take our children as created in the image of God and inspire them to become like Jesus, which is what we should be doing, which is what we should conspire to apply in the life of our children. But instead we want to make them into football players, or we want to make them ballerinas, or we want to make them like the world and its ways. We don't want them to become like God, do we? We want them to know Jesus, but then go on to be something else, of course. You know, we wouldn't want them to be so spiritually minded that they're no earthly good. Of course not, because living in the last generation, we want them to be prepared for this world that's passing away and the lust thereof. We don't want them to be prepared for heaven and what's going to happen soon. Or do we? So you see, it's kind of a dichotomy thing when you live in this last generation. What are you doing to your children? Jesus found it very easy to talk to children. He found it very hard for adults to grasp the facts of what he said. Because Jesus was straightforward. He didn't have to make up parables or metaphors or similes. He just said straightforward what he said. And you could accept it or reject it. And more often they rejected it. Even as you and I do. More often than not, you will not accept what God has to say to you at surface value. But you will try to interpret to fit your life in some way that you make fit rather than take it as just a blanket statement for you. Like when God says, all have sinned and fall short of glory to God. Well, that's good for the other guy, but not me. In Amos' video, we always apply everything that's said by God to ourselves. We don't look at the other person because it's easy to point the finger at anyone else. And whatever we do in pointing a finger at someone else, then we know that we're guilty of it ourselves. So, in some ways, the pointing of the finger is like a mirror. You can use your finger as a mirror. Whatever you see in someone else, you already know it's in you. Because that's where it first started. You would not see it unless you recognized it and there had to be something to compare it to, which is yourself, your sin. So when you see sin in others, you're only revealing that you have it in you because you're comparing it to you. And you have it. You wouldn't know what it was unless you had it. You see what it is? Just the way it goes. So, one of the things that more often than not, when Jesus said to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow me, was because we had to get to a place of no longer thinking about ourselves. We have to come to a place of always thinking of the other guy. To come to the place of always looking what can benefit the other person. How can I be the most effective servant of all? And Jesus told us, he that would be great among you, let him be the servant. But we don't do that. We try to make and elevate pastors on pedestals or ministers in pulpits, you know, and we try to set them on stages so that we look up to them rather than let them come and meet us where we're at and put us on stage and let them serve our needs. 
Because, you see, the spiritual need is not something that they have to be in front of a church in order to do. They can go to your house and share with you and care for you in an individual, personal way if that is what you would do with that person as the disciples did when they lived with Jesus. Because they lived with him, walked with him, talked with him, slept where he slept, ate what he ate, and did what he did. And that used to be a Jewish tradition with the rabbis, is that if you wanted to be like the rabbi, you had to live with the rabbi. And so they were common expressions of devotion to a person by living the same way that the rabbi lived. The tradition in those days was, I want to see him tie his shoes or lace his sandals or tie his sandals, really what it amounts to, because you kind of wrapped it around, tied it, and tied it on top. But that's what the point was, was that every person who really wanted to be a follower or a disciple of a teacher had to live with that teacher, period. There was no questions asked. You gave up your vocation for your avocation of devotion to God. The question is, when children are willing to follow Jesus, they're willing to do anything and go anywhere and be with Jesus. They'll just drop everything and go. And I wonder, are we like that today when we give our utmost for God? Are we willing to drop everything and go? Are we willing to leave it all behind to follow Jesus? Because that's what you need to figure out, whether you need to crucify yourself by hanging yourself on the cross of all your worldly desires, your flesh, your yourself, and your selfdom, in order to gain himself and his kingdom. Because selfdom is not going into the kingdom. The reality of Jesus alive in you will, but not you bringing yourself into it. Because when you can apply yourself, then you've lost what Jesus has done in the first place, which is to take your flesh and crucify that sucker and say, this will not enter the kingdom of God. I'm sorry, you're a sinner. That part of you will not go. But, I will place my spirit in you, and your spirit will join with my spirit, and you will become born again into this new creation that I will cause you to become a new type of person, that you will become not after the flesh, but after the spirit, so that it would be less of you and more of me, or more of him, as we say. So, do you begin to get the principle here? The more that there is of you, the less there is of him. The more there is of him, the less there is of you. Spiritual truth. Actual revelation. A fact in the kingdom of God. Moral dominion. Death hath no more dominion over him, in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon you yourselves to be dead, and indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Dead to sin, alive to God. No longer you that live. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the will of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. So you don't live according to your will, but according to his will. You have to find out what his will is in order to live his will. Pretty simple. If you're living with him, in other words, if you have a relationship with him, then you are living with him as he directs you where to go. But if you could wake up in the day and say, hey, you know what, I didn't bother praying and I didn't bother reading and you know what, I just kind of went to work. Guess what? You're not his disciple. You're not his follower. You're off on your own tangent, doing your own thing. So you see, that's really not the utmost. The utmost is sitting down and having a real life, genuine talk with God. Sitting down and saying, okay, do I want to be a Christian? Really? I mean, let's get blunt to it. Do I, am I willing to pay the price of what it costs me to become like Jesus? Am I willing to go the extra mile in order to follow Jesus all the days of my life? What if it costs me my job? Am I willing to go there? What if it costs me my car? Am I willing to give that up? What if it costs me my coat? Am I willing to do that? What if it costs me a slap on the face? Am I willing to turn the other cheek? What if it costs me loving the enemy? Am I willing to do that? And the reality is, if you're honest, if you are sincerely truthful about who you are, you're not willing to do that. No man is. No one without the Spirit of God in them is willing to give up those things, much less lay them down. And Jesus proved that by all those who came to him and turned away at the moment he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Because it wasn't a matter of being a zombie or a vampire. It was a matter of whether they trusted God with all or they trusted him at all. 
Because you see, if you don't trust God with all, you don't trust God at all. Because Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. It's all or nothing. Because when you're dying on a cross, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he literally means you give up your life. You die to yourself. There's no more any question of whose possessions it is. It's his, not yours. Because God raised Jesus from the dead. Who's going to raise you from the dead? Who's going to raise you into the newness of life? And then is it yours? Or are you accountable for it? And are you accountable to God for it being his? Has he entrusted you with his possessions? And that's the reality of where our lives are at if we are following Jesus. So you got to come to a place, if you are serious about following God, of having a real conversation with him and sitting down and saying, am I ready to do this? Because God will honor you by you saying, no, I'm not, and work with you till you are ready. Because he will prepare you for the ministry, even as he did with the disciples. Jesus spent three and a half years getting the disciples ready for ministry, preparing them, demonstrating, living, breathing, and being an example of a believer for them before he ever sent them out and before he ever caused the Holy Spirit to come and fill them with the ability to be his witnesses, to be his disciples, to even die like he died and to live like he lived. And he only did that after preparing them. So, at some point in time, you should sit down with God and prepare yourself to sit down and consider, like Jesus said, no man that goes to war doesn't sit down first and consider his armies and whether or not he has enough armies you know, to win the battle or whether he has enough materials if he's building a house to finish the house, lest people look at him and think that he's a fool for starting something that he couldn't finish. So you see, don't jump into something you're not ready for, but rather sit down and talk to God and say, look, I'm not ready for it. And God will say, good, that's all I want you to do. If you can admit you can't do it, God can. When you think you can do it, you can't. And if it takes you 35 years of being prepared for ministry before you're ready for ministry, or if it takes you five seconds of being saved before you're prepared to admit that in me there dwells no good thing and I can't do anything, well, then you're in the ministry. And I think that was what the joy of being in the ministry from when I got saved was about. I didn't realize I was in the ministry. As a matter of fact, I pretty much was already in the ministry, doing the ministry and accomplishing the ministry and everything was happening, but I didn't know it. I thought there was like something more than what there was because God had already prepared me. He had already set me up because I couldn't do anything for myself. Matter of fact, he about killed me so that I couldn't do anything physically for myself until I came out of that only dependent upon him. For my life solely exists at the will of God. Because at any moment, my life, I've already gone beyond what I was supposed to live. I've already been extended life that I should not have ever had. I've already been given miraculous things that should not be true in the life of someone like me. And maybe that's true for you. Maybe you were supposed to die a while back. And maybe you lived and passed through some miracle. Maybe you went through some kind of catastrophic disaster and you're still standing. Wow. Imagine that. Kept by the power of God. Oh, kept by the power of God unto salvation to be my witnesses to the world. So you see, it's not about more of you. And it's not about more of him, in a way. But it is about less of you so that he becomes more of him in you. Eternal life was manifested in our mortal flesh when we are born of God. Eternal life is not a gift from God. Eternal life is the gift of God. The energy and the power which was manifested in Jesus will be manifested in us by the sheer sovereign grace of God when once we have made the moral decision about sin. You shall receive the power of the Holy Spirit, not power as a gift from the Holy Spirit, but the power is the Holy Spirit, not something which he imparts. 
the life that was in Jesus is made ours by means of his cross when once we have made the decision to be identified with him it is difficult to get right with God it is because we will not decide definitely about sin we have to make that determination to die to self to die to our sins to you know what favorite sin you have you indulge in and you have to decide no this is not my home it's not where I belong but what I do belong with is I belong with Jesus I don't need to indulge in that sin I need to make the choice today that I will follow God irregardless of the way that my flesh has gone in the past I will choose to sin no more Jesus came to give us endless supplies of life that you might be filled with the fullness of God eternal life has nothing to do with time it is the life which Jesus lived when he was down here the only source of life is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is, in a way, a relationship and a religion in the sense that the religious idea of our relationship brings us to the point of knowing him and admitting that and allowing him to reveal himself or not knowing him at all and pretending that we have a relationship with Jesus. Because that is the contention that we will have when we stand before him one day when we say, but Lord, I did all these things in your name. But did you do them with him as he did them in you? There's a difference. One, by faith, says, I believe and I'm doing it irregardless of whether I received anything from him. And the other says, I'm not doing anything until I know that he told me to do it. And I'm not doing anything until I know that he is with me and he's leading me because I can deceive myself. You see the relationship? The relationship of one is faith without God. The other is faith in God. There is always faith. No matter what you say or how you act or believe, everyone has faith and exercises it every day of their life. Whether you flip on a light switch and expect the light to come on and are surprised when it turns off, or whether you go down and turn the keys of the car and fires right up. Although, with some cars, you never know. <laughs> but that's faith. That's that confident expectation of things you can't see, but you have a reasonable assumption that it's going to happen, regardless of whether or not it will or not. So, the point being is that there is faith, but the faith with someone is faith of Jesus is alive and well in you in a relationship that is demonstrated through the religious aspects of your life as you personify Him in your everyday existence, as you're living His life or allowing Him to live in you your life, through that with which he's done in his life. Because then you'll begin to do the same things. You will look like Jesus. You will talk like Jesus. You'll be a lot like him. You'll have peace. You'll have joy. You'll have love for your enemies. You'll have compassion upon the meek. You'll have frustration sometimes with religion and religious people that are so heavenly minded that, you know, they don't try to bring more people into the kingdom of God, but they try to do political means and they try to do social means and they try to do every other means except bring more people into Jesus the author and finish of our faith because God is the one who's accomplishing your salvation you're not he is so our part is really to share the good news of the kingdom of God that we found Jesus and he's alive so part of it is interesting in the sense of the faith of the faith in and the faith about because religion can be without God in it and it can believe in God about it. But unless it has relationship in it, it's not much of a religion, is it? The weakest saint can experience the power of the deity of the Son of God if once he is willing to let go. And literally let go of everything. Because anything that he doesn't let go will be a hindrance to his walk. Any strand of our own energy will blur the life of Jesus being alive in us. Anytime we think we have something good in us, anytime that we think we've done something ourselves, anytime that we think that we have to be the one to achieve or that we have to have our ego built up or our self-esteem lifted up or we have to make these faith assertions that I am a whatever, daughter of God, woman of God, something else, you know, that you always hear these religious people tell you, you know, by some kind of, uh, Satan, get behind me, you know, I'm not a bad person, I'm a good person, I'm going to make these assertions and just keep telling myself I'm this, 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 this. No, don't. Satan was right. You are what he said you are. But God has died for you anyways. And that's the point. 
the only basis of your self esteem is the fact that God died for you because you are a person who has no good in you there's nothing good in you but the good that you do is that from God and the God that is in you will do everything for you if you allow him and you let go of your own ideas and let him live in you then suddenly you're possessed with God and God it fills you with the love and the acceptance that you always wanted anyways so where do you think that we get all this other build up your self esteem get your power assertion from women's studies or you know I've got to assert myself and make myself and change myself and make myself look good feel good do good be good where else if Satan is alive and well and living on the planet earth but he's also alive and well and teaching in the churches he teaches just as much as we do but the reality of Jesus standing in the midst is that we have the Son of God who doesn't need to teach us about our self-esteem. He needs to remind us of why He died. And that's why we are loved and accepted in Jesus, accepted in God, because of what Jesus has done. It has nothing to do with any good you have. You have no good. It's not about what you're becoming. You have no good that you're becoming. You're becoming like Jesus because God is doing the work in you and God is doing the work. It's not about what you do. So this Pentecostal power, faith, assertions, name it, you know, make yourself feel good thing, don't go there. You're going to find out it'll fail. It'll fall flat on his face. And it always does. Because at some point in time, what kind of body do you want to have that's crucified on the cross? What kind of relationship do you have that's you know, asserting itself that I have the authority when Jesus says no you don't you don't all authority is given to Jesus in heaven and on earth and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord the glory of God our Father we have to keep letting go we keep letting go and every time we're given something we let it go because that's what God wants to test us with are you going to cling to it hang on to it and assert it as your own or are you letting it go to God and accomplish the purpose He designed it for? And slowly and surely the great full life of God will invade us in every part and men will take knowledge of us that we have been with Jesus. The reason why people get attracted to a person who's letting go and is willing to serve is because they see that they have something that everyone else doesn't. And it's not self-esteem. It's not wisdom and knowledge from God. I mean, wisdom and knowledge from studying the scriptures or from a THD, a PhD, whatever. It's from being with Jesus. They see Jesus and they want Jesus. They don't want you. <laughs> Come on. You don't want me. But any time that you could see some good in me, then you know that it's God that is at work and alive and well and shining forth out of me like a beacon light. That's just like a... Uh, lighthouse that's just kind of like, woo, and there went the beam of light. You went... Wow, look at that bright light. Where did that come from? Out of that thing? Uh, I don't think so, man. It's just some kind of like little building standing on a rock. Wow, where did that light come from again? There it is. <laughs> yeah, it must have been the Holy Spirit. Wow, look at that light. Boy, man, there is something different about that person. And that's what it is. It's not about us. Because we have to let go. We have to just be an empty vessel that the Holy Spirit can fill so that Jesus would be revealed by it. Not just what he is in us but how he lives through us as he is the light of the world and we are just really the lighthouses housing that Holy Spirit that is the light that's shining out to all men to lift up Jesus that we should be doing so that they would be drawn to him and not to us so when you're studying with your utmost always remember that the utmost means you die and he lives the utmost means less of you, more of him. The utmost means you will stand there on a cross and die for the sake of those that are persecuting you. And if you're not willing to, don't watch utmost. Because we're not messing around here. It's the end of the world. We're not playing games about will this happen or is this right, wrong, or otherwise. Go play back in the sandbox if you need that. But what we're talking about in utmost video is the reality of God. In man you dwell. The reality of Emmanuel, God in us, God with us, God for us, and God doing through us that which he wants to do, whether we want to do it or not. <laughs> and that's going to be a key to really letting go, because most of the time you won't want to do it, but he will.